church. It's so good to see you this morning. Anybody got a whoop whoop? <laughs> All right, here we go. say hello, uh, let them know that they look good today, and that we're happy to have them in the house of God, amen.
goes before us. He's fighting those battles for us. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes we can only see this far, just right in front of our face. But God sees. He sees. He knows the end. Hallelujah. The scripture says that he knew us before the foundations of the earth. He knew. He had us planned. He knows what's going on in your life. I need to give him praise today. Um, my kiddo, uh, my favorite child, don't tell the others, just kidding. Um, my oldest kid um, plays soccer, and uh, he, he was injured. This is his senior year, and he's been hyping up this season for months. Literally, it's been so important to him. And uh, he was saying, we're going to bring the trophy home, and, you know, I'm just, just so excited. And um, about the third or fourth game, and I don't remember, he injured his knee really badly. Uh, he subluxed his patella. It was over, not where it's supposed to be. And then they thought he might have an ACL tear in there as well. And it was super swollen. He was on crutches. And basically, everything that we saw online said your recovery time is, you know, three to six months for any and one of those things. So um, he was just so disappointed. And um, they did an MRI. And we had prayer here at church. Some people, I wasn't even involved in the prayer, but somebody prayed for him out in the foyer, gathered around him one Sunday and prayed for him. And he had an MRI that week, and they said, it was just a really, really, really bad bruise. It's just, it was just swollen. <laughs> and so it wasn't torn. The meniscus wasn't torn. And, and, and he decided he was going to give his senior night game a, a try, just like five minutes. That's what his plan was. He had a brace on and said, I'm just going to try to play five minutes for the pictures and everything. It's a big deal that they do at the school. And he ended up playing three-fourths of that game, played four games, four games the next week. And um, it may not seem like a big deal to you, but to him, it was a real big deal. To this mama, it was a big deal. And we give praise to God. He knows the desires of our hearts. And even those things that you think aren't very important to God, if they're important to you, they're important to God. He is concerned about the details of our lives. There's a song that we used to sing that said he is able to, to, uh, to handle everything that, con that concerns us the most. The things that, that we may think, you know, maybe God's not concerned about that in my life, but he is. We give him praise for that. Hallelujah. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken.
by the way, I stopped at the Quick Trip, which is my uh, my uh, routine on Sunday to pick up a Diet Pepsi. Uh, and while I was in there, this lady said, you smell beautiful. Now, for a lot of people, a lot of, lot of men, they don't get those kind of compliments, but I'm old hand. And I said to myself, Saturday night baths work for me. <laughs> she was like, boy, you hit that joke quick. I was like, what joke? <laughs> I'm so glad to have you here today to visit with us and to hang out with us and worship and everybody online. We're so excited. Uh, to have you here with us. You know, around here, we like to do a few things. We like to, one, help people know God. Two, help people find freedom. Three, help people discover their purpose. And four, we like to help them make a difference. And that, my friends, brings us to the next thing. Somebody say Fast Track. Fast Track. Hey, if you haven't done Fast Track, that is your next step. It is uh, Fast Track uh, is our program all in one day at Fast Track. You'll enjoy a delicious lunch with Pastor Les, John, uh, Jen, and others. Learn about our heart's mission, discover your purpose, find out how you can join our dream team in making a difference. Visit familychurch.net and click on the growth track to RSVP. Amen. So I say dream team. Dream team. At Family Church, we are not contributors, not just consumers, we believe you are never more like Jesus than when you are serving others. Amen. Are you on the team? That's the question. Are you with the team? Are you in, Are you all in? If you're not, you're missing the opportunity to make real impact on someone. We have so many dedicated dream teamers, and you can link arms with them, join to make a difference. Jesus said the harvest is truly is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Amen. He, uh, he is talking about souls. Amen. We, are, we, are, we have precious souls here at Family Church, and the, the, the harvest is right. Many of you have wisdom to love and to impact uh, people. It's time to say, send me. Somebody, raise your hand and say, send me. If you are ready to answer the call, let us know by speaking to us after service by clicking on the Leaders and Dream Team link at FamilyChurch.net to make a difference. Somebody say small group. Small group. Hey, at Family Church, we are a family. We're not saying we're just a family. We are a family. We really are. And we believe that freedom is found in community. It is, uh, it's just tons of fun. Visit FamilyChurch.net and Click on the calendar link on the menu to pick up a, a half, or just pick up that half-page flyer if it's there uh, at the Welcome Center to learn about all the opportunities to connect coming up. Iron sharpens iron. If you believe that, raise your hand. And we are thankful for the opportunity to come together and spur each other on in the mission to love God and love people. Amen. Somebody say, get the 411. Get the 411. Yes, we want to stay connected to you. Visit familychurch.net. Scroll to the bottom of the page to subscribe, to receive email and text message updates. You can also share a prayer request or a praise report. By the way, Sister Tessa's at home with the sciatic thing, so if you could just drop a prayer for her this morning, that would be awesome. She said, tell my folks to just pray for me today. I said, Amen. I said, I'm sure they will. But if you want to receive text messages, you can also text, text me to 636-204-5800. Again, that's text me to 636-204-5800. The 2021 calendar is filling up. Visit familychurch.net slash calendar to see all the goings on. Pastor? Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen, amen, amen. It's good to see everyone this morning. If you're watching online, God bless you. It's good to see you too. Pray for those that are out sick this weekend that are watching. Amen. Praying for you that God just gets you back 
whole. And so you get back here, get back in the family chair. Amen. But thank you for watching this morning and worshiping with us. And everyone here, if you're a first-time guest this morning or returning guest, it's so good to have you here this morning. Hey, we're so honored that you would be here. Amen. We pray that God blesses you and your family this morning. Hey, Harvest Party is coming up. Are you excited about that? Harvest Festival, October 24th. It's right around the corner. Amen. Five o'clock here at the church grounds. And got a great, great fun. Invite your family, your friends, uh, trunk or treat. Get your trunk or treat ideas going. Amen. We'll see who has the most creative trunk while they pass out the treats. And I'm talking about your vehicle. Okay. I'll move on. There's going to be inflatables here and so much, much more. Yes, I'm going to make again some of my favorite Louisiana gumbo. Chicken and sausage. Amen. Gumbo. So if you like uh, gumbo or not really sure what gumbo is, come on around here and, uh, and uh, come on around. It's a good time. Also, chili will be here. And uh, so check your inbox this week. Hey, if you've not signed up for our new text message uh, system, you want to do that, go to the church website. There's information there about how to sign up for that. Amen. It's a new system. Hey, everyone say this Wednesday. <laughs> yes, this Wednesday, just a few days from now, October 6th, here at 7 o'clock. Amen. We're going to have a wonderful first Wednesday study. We've got a new study we're kicking off here. Also, I want to say tacos and nachos. Yes. You don't have to worry about cooking Wednesday night. Just get here about 6 o'clock. We'll have tacos and nachos for you. Just a, just a donation of 5 bucks per person, or if you bring your whole family, just 20 bucks a family. So, so we want to see you here this Wednesday night. It's going to be an amazing first Wednesday study and a great food and great fellowship. Amen. We're pointing people towards Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, at Family Church, we, are, we try to live by this principle here. We like to be generous. We like to live out of our lives out of generosity and give. And we learned through our giving and, man, how we can impact people's lives and touch people's lives. Your time, your resources, your words of encouragement, amen, your financial resources to the church as well, amen. We want to share the gospel as much as we can, however we can. And your giving makes it possible here at Family Church every single day, every single week. Thank you for your weekly giving, amen, giving the tithe and offering. Thank you so much to give. There's multiple ways you can give here this morning. There's pay, offering pans up here on the stage that you can drop your offering in, or you can go online. If you're watching, you can just pause for a few moments and go online and give that way as well. Text to give also, and we also, a lot of people do bill pay, or just get your envelope, pencil, and paper in a stamp and stick it on there and just drop it in the mail. However you choose to give today, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for giving. Amen. Thank you for making a difference in people's lives for eternity. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning that we have the opportunity to be good stewards of the blessings in our life. God, we just share this blessing. Amen. We give our tithe and offering to you this morning in the wonderful name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can be a part amen, of your great plan. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give unto the Lord this morning. And to the Lord, say, God is good. God is good. Our toddlers class, our preschool, elementary school, high school, we may be dismissed today. Middle school is going to stay in this morning with us. Jude has already uh, passed out some papers to you this morning, amen, to help you with all of our middle school students to be a part of the lesson today. Amen. Amen. It's a preschool, elementary, so God bless you. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We're kind of kicking off a new study this morning into the book of Revelations. Amen. And who likes Revelations? Oh, yeah. Especially with everything that's going on in our country and our society and world, you know, it's kind of interesting to see uh, where are we on God's timetable and where are we in our walk with God. Amen. If you'd asked me, do you think it's possible that the Lord could come in my lifetime? I think so. I think it's very possible. Will I be disappointed if he doesn't? No, because sooner or later I'm going to meet up with him. Amen. But while I'm here, I want to do everything I possibly can to serve the Lord. My mind, my heart. 
all my heart, with all my life. I want to do everything I can to point people to Christ on my good days and maybe more importantly, my bad days. Because <laughs> there's someone always watching you. All of us are leaders. All of us have influence. Amen. And someone's always watching. So as I jump into the book of Revelations, I want to kind of lead with that because when you open up the book of Revelations, it just kind of pulls back a little bit of back where, where God has us headed. It's a study in the book of Revelations. I want to start out with the first seven churches. Amen. And, and their struggles, their good points, their challenging areas that they were at. You look at the first couple chapters there. Smyrna, it was the home of Homer, big city in Rome. Polycarp was a bishop there. He was martyred. Pergamus was located in Rome's uh, capital area. It was a major hub culture, housed a huge library, the Alexandria Collection. Thyatira was founded under Alexander the Great, noted for its trade and Purple dyed, Lydia, one of Paul's converts, came from that region. Sardis is one of the ancient capitals of the Lydia kingdom, um, kind of on top of a plateau in the terrain. Philadelphia, they called it the gateway to the east, was renowned for grapes and textiles and leather goods. Laodicea, most, probably the most popular city that most of us know because we've heard a lot of message about the church at Laodicea. Have you heard a message about Laodicea? Yeah, yeah. It was... Uh, Part of the ancient capital there gained wealth and trade and banking, and it was known for its medical school and costly fabrics. But today we're going to talk about Ephesus. Uh, the Lord had a lot of great comments about the church at Ephesus. It was a, but it was a major harbor on the Igerian Sea, which is kind of flows into the Mediterranean there, uh, what we know as Turkey today. It sat on the coast there. It housed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple of Hermes, uh, a goddess that worshiped, for, they worshiped the goddess of fertility. So with that in mind there, I'd like to read to you the first couple verses here of the second book of Revelation, verses one through seven. Oh, by the way, here's a, here's a, here's a nice slide there, if you can see that this evening, this morning, whatever time of day it is, wherever you're at. Uh, you can see there on the tip there, Turkey, and uh, how they all kind of sat there on the, overlooking the, the ocean there. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those things, those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. It goes on to verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Verse 5. Remember those, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly, remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. In verse 7. Well, it's got a mind of its own up here. He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And you said, Lord, bless your word. I tell you, I grew up listening to a lot of revelations growing up. And man, we had a prophecy conference every year. And you would love to go, but it would scare the socks off of you. 
because you would go to bed every night wondering if you were going to make heaven your eternal home or are you going to be roommates with the devil for eternity. I tell you what, it really just made you, made me examine my heart and my life. And it really just caused me to think, Lord, where am I at with you as a young person in my life? And as we kind of grow older and grow up, you know, you kind of grow callous to life, grow callous to sin, and kind of some things don't bother you like they used to, and so on and so forth. And, and so, you know, you think of where you're at. But as I opened the book of Revelations uh, this weekend and I began to just go back to those childhood thoughts and thinking, man, as a child, I really had a sincere fear and awe of God. And I'm so thankful for that, that I had an awe and just respect for God. And I could just only imagine what it was like for John uh, at the time there after Jesus' death and, 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 the, the, and his resurrection and the Lord was caught up in the book of Acts, you know, into the heavens and the disciples went out and ministered. And things began to get really hostile for them after, after that. And according to tradition, every disciple except for one was martyred for his faith. And John's fate wasn't much better than theirs. I mean, he was exiled to a horrible island called Patmos. And if we could see it on the map, it would be just off the coast of Turkey. But during his exile... John had a, an amazing relationship with the Lord. There it says on the, on the Lord's day, amen, that he was in the spirit. And while John was on that island of Patmos, he had visions and dreams that the Lord gave him and revealed far off future events that John had not witnessed just yet. And John gave these messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor in the Turkey area. And they came with two different things. They came with words of encouragement and they came with words of correction. And also a promise saying that he who overcomes, amen, will eat from that tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden of the paradise of God. But I want to tell you something. Have you ever wondered what the Lord looks like? You know, you have to go back to Isaiah about 700 years before the birth of Christ to kind of get a good idea what Jesus maybe looked like. Uh, definitely doesn't match up to uh, the pictures we see hanging on the wall today. Um, I think Jesus was a rough, tough dude. I think Jesus was somebody you probably wouldn't have want to mess with. Uh, I mean, he was raised as a carpenter's son, so he knew how to carry himself and carry a lot of heavy wood, right? Uh, also, uh, you know, he uh, was afraid to take matters into his own hands sometimes, running people out of the temple, you know? Uh, so he had to be kind of rough and tough and for people to kind of back up, okay, we're out of here, you know? But biblically speaking, we don't really know what Jesus looked like. Uh, Isaiah kind of describes him as an average person, Nothing that you would really, you know, take notice of. Not very conspicuous in any way. But when John saw him in the book of Revelation, it's a whole nother story. I mean, it just blows your mind to think, man, this is what John saw. John saw a much different Christ than they did on the sands of the seas of Galilee. You know, Jesus had white hair, which suggested perhaps wisdom and and uh, befitting of a, of a counselor and of a judge. He says his eyes were like flames as fire, which just would see and nothing was hidden from him. Then John describes his mouth having a, a, a large noisy sound, loud sound and a sword drowning out all of the voices, maybe invoking like the thoughts of roaring waterfalls. And that sword piercing the soul and the spirit, which represented the word of God. And in his right hand, John said, there was the seven stars representing his authority and, and the stars of the pastors, the seven churches, amen, that he led, helped lead and gave authority to lead the churches. This vision of Christ that John saw in the book of Revelations was so awe-inspiring that John basically passed out as if he were dead. Like others in could you just imagine being in the presence of God and seeing that, amen, the pure holiness and righteousness of God. When you see the Lord in Revelation, he's no longer in meek and mild. 
but he comes in with uh, putting evil in its place and all enemies under his feet when he returns. So when you read this message of the seven churches of Asia, it's, it's encouragement, yet it's also a reminder and a warning that judgment is coming. And John also extends hope and encouragement to all that will listen and follow through. When you look at church at Ephesus, John leads off with that church. I'm not really sure why he led off with that church, but uh, some theologians call it a loveless church, a church that looked good on the outside, but on the inside, it was like the kind of the Pharisaical cup. Those who were here last weekend, uh, I had the giant gumbo pot up here, the pots up here. You know, it, it, your pot looks good on the outside, your cup looks good on the outside, as Jesus talked about the cup or the white sepulcher that's white on the outside, but there's dead men bones on the inside. Or maybe your cup is like this, it's beautiful on the outside, but you look on the inside, it's filled with muck and yuck. Jesus was admonishing and encouraging those, hey, you may look good on the outside like the Pharisees. They know what to say. They know when to stand. They know when to clap their hands. They know when to show up to church. They know how many services they can miss without getting a phone call from the pastor. Or, or you know, and, and they know all these different things. They know how far to push it before they know something's going to happen. A reaction will happen. But you look good. You know what to do. But there's something missing on the inside. You know the scripture, you know the songs, but then John is saying, hey guys, um, the Lord says, hey, you, you know you're doing a lot of great things and we appreciate that, but you're missing the most important part of the piece, stage step one. You lost your, you left your first love. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. It's like you almost forgot what this is all about. You forgot the purpose of the church. You forgot the church is not a building or a piece of land and chairs, and bathrooms, and a parking lot, and a basketball goal. Church is not that. Church is, it, it all started with the man who died on the cross to pay the ransom for your sin. That's what church is about. We are the body of Christ. We just put this building up so we have somewhere to come and gather. We thank God for that. Everything looked good on the Ephesian church outwardly, but their heart was no longer in it. I remember that big pot up here last week, and man, it was so shiny on the outside and so wonderful on the inside, but you always check inside the pot before you put anything in it. It's like when you, you, when you turn on the oven, I always look inside the oven to be sure what's in there and what's not in there. Because how many times that happened to you? Oh yeah, it's happened to me once, thankfully. And you know, if you got a good dishwasher or you know, an automatic dishwasher, or maybe you have a, someone that washes your dishes for you at the house. My rule of thumb, always check inside the cup. Always turn a light on and look inside the cup. You never know what's left in the cup. And some of us, we forgot to look inside. Sometimes we don't like looking in the mirror because we don't like what we'll see. Just like when you walk by the bathroom scale, you see the scale there. You don't want to get on it because it's going to have bad news. <laughs> and so many times we get in the habit unconsciously about pointing fingers and pointing out flaws in this and that, and, or that person, or that person, or that group, or that person, or you know where I'm going. And we never forget to look at our own self and see exactly where we're at. 
we become judge, jury, and executioner. And Jesus says, don't worry about judging other people. Just take care of yourself. I'll take care of them. You focus on you. But, but, Brother Terrence, it's just how I was raised. This is the environment I grew up in. I'm going to get there in a little bit. The church at Ephesus, they, 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 they had an area in their heart they were just not wanting to look at. And the psalmist wrote, Lord, search the secret places of my heart. Search the secret places of my life. The places that are taboo, that are off. From... No, you can't look there. Places maybe not even your kids or your spouse know about that you've been hiding and building walls around and trying to to keep it secret. But this morning, I wonder if you're watching online or here in the service today, can you be so bold to take a step of faith this morning and realize you won't be refused, that you'll find a welcome home band playing for you at the cross. There's room for you this morning at the cross. And realize there is room for you, even though those places are dark and scary and maybe they're full of shame and regret, there's still room at the cross for you this morning. Tear down the walls and let Christ in. Like the psalmist wrote, Lord, search the secret places of my just don't go through the motion like a mannequin in church. You look alive, but you're really spiritually dead. Amen. Don't leave here spiritually dead. Another service. You will find love. You will find hope. You will find mercy. You will find a God that has never given up on you, that has never stopped loving you. Paul said it like this. If you want homework this evening, something you enjoy reading, read Romans 6. Starts out, what shall we say to, what shall we say then? Kind of, Paul kind of, I don't know, Paul kind of gets sarcastic every once in a while. Starts leading with a question, you know, kind of trip them up, you know. Shall we continue in sin that is grace, that grace may abound? Paul says, shall we can just continue on sinning like I've been doing for 20 years? Because I know grace is going to be there. Paul in verse 2 says, certainly not. <laughs> How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? He says, hey, you're dead. That old lifestyle is dead, buried, and boom, it's over. You made a clean break when you met Christ at the cross. And you said you baptized in his name. You're a public follower. You're empowered by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. He says, Paul says, hey, folks, that life is over. That's not you anymore. We don't want to continue to that because look, Christ has done our lives. Verse 3 says, or you do not know that many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of life. Come on. Are you loving that new life this morning? I'm loving this new life in Christ. I got too many balls and chains, too many aircrafts filled with Samsonite luggage that I just wanted to see the Lord just fly off into the ocean and go in that sea of forgetfulness. That is not me anymore, folks. I'm not going to blame my past. I'm not going to blame my parents. I'm not going to blame my neighbors. I'm not going to blame the school I went to or what side of the train tracks I lived on. Sometimes I thought I lived in the middle of the train track and I saw a train coming at me. Is that how you felt sometimes? I'm not going to blame this person or that person for how I'm acting here right now. The only person I'm going to blame is Jesus Christ because what he did in my life, I just can't get over. I just love what Jesus did in my heart and my life. And there is no way I'm going to go back for where he brought me from. I'm not going back to Egypt. I'm not going to cross that Red Sea. I'm not, I'm not going to find me a different sea to fish yet. I'm going to the Jordan. Because the Jordan leads right to the promised land. That's where I'm going. Come on. Whoever thought Ephesus could be so fun? 
Man, there's so much rich stuff. When you look at Ephesus, you realize God's watching. He says, I know you. I know your works. It's so good to know that Christ is in our hearts and our lives and know what he's, he's involved in. And I'm so thankful for him that to take time to come alongside me and say, hey, man, get back in your lane, man. Get your lane, bro. He said, I want you to remember. Remember. You can write that down. Remember. Remember, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Just take a few moments today. If you're not sure where you need to be in your walk with God. Think back what your relationship with Christ used to be when you were first saved, when you first came out of sin, when he delivered you from whatever he delivered you from. Some he delivered you from lying, cussing. Some of you delivered to man from um, drugs and alcohol. Some of you were cheating on your spouse. Some of you were, were this. Some of you were that. Like Paul says, I was the chief sinner, man. I was the worst of the worst. I hurt people. I beat people up. I left them for dead. I threw them in jail just because they served, them, served Christ. Remember, but Paul says, I obtained mercy. Oh, I remember as a little kid in the fourth grade, man, coming up to, I don't know, we had this altar that seemed like a half a mile long, and it was, I was somewhere over here on this side of the altar, and I knelt down, and I was praying, and let me tell you what, I did not get up from that prayer meeting until I really felt the burdens that were hanging on my life as a fourth grade kid fall and hit the floor and roll under the cross and be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I cried. I was sorry. For my sins as a fourth grader. I mean, come on. What do fourth graders know back in the 70s? They didn't know a whole lot. But I knew that I probably lied at least once. I knew that I probably stole a cookie out of the cookie jar. I tell you, people are not ashamed of sin anymore. There's almost nothing that causes us to blush anymore. Am I right? It's a front page new line. It's a headline. Some of you are probably committing sins and you don't even care about anymore. I tell you what, you need to get your book out. Get your mirror out. That's the word of God. And see yourself as Christ sees you. See yourself as Christ sees you. You know, that's exactly what he was doing to the church at Ephesus. I know your works. I know what's going on. I know, I, know, I know what you got going on that nobody else knows about. I know your business. I know the stuff that nobody else knows about. Why? Because I'm God. And I, my eyes are like flames of fire and nothing is hid from me. He says, you're doing really good in this area here, but we need to work on your heart. And I wanted to bring you back this morning to where you first met Christ. And you had an experience of repentance that caused you to want to change your life radically from the inside out, to change direction. That's what repentance is. That means I'm sorry for my sins, but also means I'm not, I don't want to go back down this road again. That's what true repentance is, that I do not want it anymore. I tell you, I'll never forget the day that I cussed in front of my Sunday school teachers. Scott. We were playing, I don't know, tackle football or something like that. I mean, on Sunday afternoon, we were having a blast. I mean, we were just creaming each other. And, man, I missed a play. And I was down on the I – was, I was one of the offensive tackle guys or whatever they, these guys. I was down on my knees. I'm like, you know, we're just ready. I was ready for the snap. Hut, hut. And – I missed the play, and I was so mad. Got back down to the line again, and and I said, oh, just blank. I didn't remember the word it was. Thank God I don't. But I said it loud enough to where everybody in a 30-feet radius could hear me. Then all of a sudden, it dawned on me. My Sunday school teacher is three feet from me, in front of me. 
I tell you what, you ever, you, have you ever heard of that, that eerie silence? Just, that's what happened. You can hear crickets in the woods. Chirp, chirp, chirp. I'm thinking, Jesus, I want you to come quickly. No, I don't. I don't, I don't want you to come quickly because I think I'll miss the rapture because they're set in my heart, Lord. Don't, just, just give me a couple hours, Lord. And I didn't know what to do. That was like the longest play on earth. I was like, please hike the ball, hike the ball, please hike the ball. But that's a moment. Actually, I, when I was in Lake Charles here a while back, I actually drove by the field where we were, I, I, I did that incident happen. And I remember it so well because it was a place in the Old Testament, when they, make a, when they would consecrate, when they would make a sacrifice, when they make a declaration to the Lord, they would, take, they, would, they would take some stones, they would build like a little makeshift altar, and they would pray. That's exactly what happened in the middle of that field there. I didn't have physical stones, but I built a memorial right there because there was something in my heart that says, you know what, I never want to go back down this path again. I never want this to happen between me and my God and my Sunday school teacher again. I want to learn from this moment and purpose that I want to grow my walk with God. Have I slipped up since then? God only knows. I'm flesh, probably so. But you know what? I've determined I'm going to put the God's word. I'm going to hide it in my heart. Why am I going to hide God's word in my heart? So I don't sin against him. If you, got a, if you got some direction and correction getting happening in your life, start getting into the Word of God. Because Philippians 4.13, I don't know where Scott's at this morning. Scott, what's Philippians 4.13? Just shout it out, brother. Come on. Remember what Christ has done in your heart and your life. Repent. Repent. Turn away from your present course and turn towards Christ. Turn your heart back towards the Lord today. Well, how long does my prayer repentance need to be, Pastor? As long as it takes. As long as it takes. It may just take a few moments, or you may need to just linger around the altar a little while until you feel like you've just got it all out. It can take just a few moments. Lord, that prayer there on the football field that day, it probably wasn't maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds at the most. But it was a prayer in a place that changed my life still to this day over 40 years later. That's what repentance is. It's knowing that God has forgiven you and you're determined not to go back down that path. Pastor, do I need to re repeat it? Well, sure. Paul says, I die daily. I die daily. Every morning, Every evening, I just want to take a few minutes to just reflect on where I've been with Christ and what he wants to do in my life today. Wherever you're at this morning, I just want to ask you, would you stay with me just for a few moments here today? And let's just pray together. I want you to pray along with me this morning. And just pray from your heart. Pray from your heart. Pray what you're thinking about. Pray where you want God to bring you. Lord Jesus, God, I just ask you this morning, this afternoon, today, whatever time of day it is, they're watching. God, that you would search our hearts today. God, that you allow us to show us and that you know us, that you know what we're struggling with today, Lord. God, that you care and you have compassion on us, God, to help us through our struggles, Lord, today. 
God, we bring our struggles, our sins to the cross this morning. God, we're asking you for your forgiveness and your mercy today, Lord. Lord, I just pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that you would touch each and every one of us this morning, Lord. That you would touch our hearts and our lives today, God. That we would know that there's mercy and compassion at the foot of the cross this morning, God. God, I repent of my sins. God, I ask for your forgiveness, Lord. Just share your sins. God, I ask you, Lord, to heal my mouth, Lord. God, that I would never curse again, taking the Lord's name in vain. God, I ask for your, thank you, Lord, that all these years, God, you've been faithful and true to me, Lord. God, I ask you for your forgiveness, God, for my wandering eyes, God. God, Lord, let my eyes look on pure things and holy things, dear God. God, my thoughts, God, that when we venture off into places, they don't need to go, Lord. God, I repent of my thoughts, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Wherever you're at this morning, whatever you're struggling with today, I just want to encourage you to share with the Lord. Ask him for his forgiveness and mercy. God, he knows if you're going to purpose in your heart, amen, that I don't want to go down this road, Lord, ever again this morning. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Would you sing this chorus with me today as we just think about what God is going to do for us and what he's done in Jesus' name? Amen. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of
Jesus be the center. Jesus be the center of your church. This church, God. Jesus be the center of your church. And every knee will bow, every tongue shall confess you, Jesus, 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 sing his name, Jesus, oh Jesus, you're the sinner, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, oh and take me back. Take me back and take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back, oh Lord, and take me back, dear Lord, where I first received you. Take me back, oh, sing it today. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Say it, say it as a prayer this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Take me back. Thank you, Jesus. Take me back. God, help us kindle the fire in Jesus' name. Kindle the fire, Lord, in Jesus' name. Stir up the gift of God that's in us, Lord, today. Stir up our faith and believe what you're able to do in our hearts and life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Did you have a good talk with the Lord this morning? Come on, give him thanksgiving this morning. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Did he talk back to you? 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. He called you. He empowers us to be victorious. Hey, he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Not to be dull, but to be bright. He called you to be salt and to be light. In Jesus' name, let's be salt and light. Amen. Let's turn up the heat. Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gift of God that's in you. When I prayed for you, I saw what God did in your heart and your life. You know what God did in your life, right? Hey, come on now. Let's turn it up this morning. Let's believe God's going to do greater things in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If there's somebody close to you this morning that you would feel comfortable just maybe praying with them this morning, let's just pray a, pray a blessing, a strength on them today. Amen. Lord, we just pray. In the name of Jesus, God, we just ask you, God, just to strengthen every church family member this morning, God. Those that are watching online, we pray for them, God, that the power of God would strengthen their lives and their hearts in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray. We thank you for the gift of the cross, God, what you did for our lives, God, how you bought and paid the price for our sin today, Lord. In Jesus' name, God, let us realize that we have been resurrected in the newness of life, God, empowered by your Spirit, that we can do all things through Christ, who gives us the strength to Keep moving forward and to avoid the pit holes and the traps of sin in Jesus' name. Amen. To be new in Christ in Jesus' name. God, I give you thanksgiving and praise this morning, Lord. God, that we can experience that newness in our life by the power of your spirit in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Wherever you're at in your walk with God, I just want to encourage you this week, take a step. Take one step of faith, amen, and let God just dig into your heart, dig into Christ today, Lord, amen, and just see what Christ has for you in Jesus' name. He has a purpose for you, amen. If you're not discovered your purpose, amen, join our class coming up, amen, and we'll help you discover your purpose in Christ in Jesus' name. God bless you. I hope you have a great week. Hey, we will see you this Wednesday because this Wednesday is First Wednesday. Amen. Let us know. RSVP for tacos and nachos. Let us know if you're coming. Shoot us a text or an email. Let us know. Amen. So we can prepare a great fun for you Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Amen. 7 o'clock. Our Bible study is going to crank up. God bless you in Jesus' name.